All right. Years ago, we used to sing a song, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Whenever I look out here and see everybody doing this, I think of family. Because we are. Amen. Bless you, brother. Love you. Praise God. You know what? I just forgot your first name. Pat. Pat. I'm sorry, Pat. Well, praise the Lord. Pat was sharing something with me. The Lord spoke to her during our worship time today, and I want her just to share it real quick. I just saw over the building this huge honeycomb of heaven, and the honey began to drip down over all of us. And the Lord said, come, taste and see that I am good. And then he said, some of you out here, quite frankly, excuse my French, your life has been crap. But he says, this is going to be a turnaround year. Yes. So come and make an effort and taste and see that the Lord is good because oh, he's going to change God. your circumstances. Amen. That's a good word right there. You need to take hold of that. You need to take hold of that. Glory to God. You know uh, what Mike was saying earlier. Oh, oh, by the way, did anybody's back pain leave somebody's back or their back get aligned? He asked me to ask that. Anybody? Praise the Lord. A couple of you over here. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Um, while we were worshiping and while Mike was ministering up here, uh, as he began to talk, I saw, and, and many, some of you have been around here for a while, you'll understand what I'm talking about, about the, our building here in, in this church, that the Lord is just, you know, every church that God plants has its own specific purpose. We're all, all a part of the kingdom together, and we should all flow in harmony together in the Holy Ghost. But each tribe in Israel had its own name and its own purpose. And churches are that way. And our purpose here primarily is prayer and healing. God told me uh, not too long back, he said, your church is not a library, it's a hospital. And uh, there are library churches. There are churches where it's teach, 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 and that's good because the Bible says that there are people that are ordained to teach, and we teach around here too. It's not that we don't teach, but there just seems to be certain emphasis on a, a ministry or on a, even a person as far as that goes, and so you, you stay with that purpose, you stay with that emphasis. But anyway, um, the, uh, today uh, what I saw, I saw from heaven an army of angels, warrior angels, as we begin to worship and praise, as we begin to, as, the, as, as Mike was ministering, come down. And as he began to give those words about pharmacia and about families and about Madeira, I saw them just flood out in all directions. And they were after the enemies that have been after you and your family. They were after them. You know, David, under the anointing, said, let the angel of the Lord chase them. When God shows up, he always, it's not always to give you a hug, especially if you're his enemy. Come on. One angel, this king uh, Sennacherib, Boasted against the, the God, and your God's not going to stop me. No other gods could stop me, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. That night, one angel showed up and killed 185,000 of his soldiers. When God gets after his enemies, he gets after them. And I saw the angel of the Lord going after the enemies of your family this morning. And I don't say that lightly. I will give an account for every word I speak, especially standing up here. And I, I mean, I saw it with the eyes of my understanding. I didn't have an open vision or something, but I, I saw it in my spirit. Amen. And I saw God doing what was being said. Yeah. So hallelujah. hallelujah. Also, one other thing real quick before I start. Uh, you know, I heard a story years ago. And this came to me during worship about a woman who, this is back during the 40s and 50s in the great healing revival they had. She had some kind of a condition, I forget what it was, it was a serious condition, and she had gone to a lot of these healing tent meetings and had a lot of the, you know, who's who in the ministry uh, lay hands on her and pray for her, and she had not been healed. And so this one uh, minister was praying for her one day in one of these prayer lines, and uh, he asked her if she was healed, and she said, well, I sure hope so. And so he knew he had to get her in faith, he had to engage her faith with this. You know, most people are healed by a mutual faith. The minister or whoever it is that's laying hands on you, all believers can lay hands on the sick and they'll recover, needs to have enough faith to lay hands on you and believe what the word says, and you need to have faith to receive it. It's not always a one-sided deal. 
Now, I realize there's time God flood, floods a building and everybody gets healed, I mean, just in his presence. Moses went up and sat 40 days in his presence, and that empowered him to live a full, healthful, healthful life for 120 years. So those things can happen. 120 years, his eyes weren't dim, it says. His, his strength wasn't abated, and he walked uphill to his own funeral. God had to tell him when to die. Time to die, Moses. Go up here and die. <laughs> he had the strength to climb a mountain to die. So there's great things in the presence of God, but most of the time it's a situation where people take hold, take hold of the covenant, take hold of healing. Amen? I couldn't tell any difference. Hello, hello, hello. Ah, there we are. Praise God. So, anyway, this woman, let's get back to the woman. Let's don't leave her standing there without being healed. Amen. He looked at her and he said, he said, uh, he says, can you, do you believe that God's word's true? She said, well, yes. He said, well, let me ask you this. Can you praise God that his word's true? She said, yes. He said, then that's what I want you to do. When you go home, if you're washing dishes, if you're doing this, you're doing that, I want you just to praise and thank God that his word concerning healing is true. And, of course, long story short, she got healed within a couple of days. She had the manifestation. And I sensed that there was a, a woman here in this service or maybe over the Internet. I don't know as the Internet is. We're going live over the Internet right now. That it's the same situation with you. You've been prayed for a lot of times, and it just things just haven't been able to click. God wants you to know that if you will, and here's the way He said it to me. Lord, bring it back to my memory. I didn't write it down. He said, "If you will praise, if you will stop asking me for what you should be praising me for, you'll see it." That's nothing wrong with asking God, but there comes a point in time when you need to receive what He said to you, what He's imparted to you. And start praising him and thanking him for it. See, praise, if you think about it, is the highest form of faith there is. Because when you're praising God for who he is and what he's done, there can't be any doubt and unbelief in that. Amen. So if you're here today or if you're on the Internet there or wherever, just receive that word. I pray that you will and, and connect with it. Grab your Bible this morning and turn over with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. You know, I don't know why the Lord gives me good stuff at 4 o'clock in the morning and then won't let me preach it that day. Some of you need to talk to him about that, you know. I don't know how many times that happens to me. This morning I got up about 4 o'clock, and, uh, man, I had, he was giving me some good stuff, and I'm like, oh, good. You know, I should have known better. It's happened already so many times. But he's God and I'm not. Amen? You missed a real good place to say amen right there. And so he wants me to share something, and then it was just confirmed when Karen got up here and said what she said, went right down the line with uh, what the Lord was showing me. Matthew chapter 6. You know, Jesus was preparing people for the time when he wouldn't be here anymore in his earthly ministry, in, in a human body. Amen? And so he was always teaching his disciples and teaching people that would, uh, had open hearts to receive and so forth. And here in Matthew, this area of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, there's some really good stuff here because he's addressing issues that could distract you or detract you from the pathway that God has for you. He's talking about spiritual things, you know, here in in uh, chapter 5, he's talking about how to handle situations, uh, you know, when people uh, don't treat you right. And he uh, talks about, you know, uh, back over in verse 27 in Matthew chapter 5, he uh, talks about how sin is in the heart. It becomes, it's a heart motive thing and so forth. And here uh, uh, in uh, verse 38, he starts talking about retaliation and how to handle things, you know, in a right way to keep yourself from being spiritually blind. Amen. And how to deal with enemies. In verse 43, he starts talking about how to handle people that are your enemies and then almsgiving and prayer and fasting and how to do those things to where you do them in a right way where they can be accepted of God 
and it produces the results of God. Because you can have dead religion, dead works in anything. Amen. Uh, you know, people think because they fast that they're going to push God's buttons and he's going to do something. doesn't work that way. Amen. Fasting put, helps put you in a position so you can connect with what's already happening in your heart and what God has to say. Now, I'm not saying that you can't go on a fast purposely like Daniel did and seek the Lord and all that. But if, if you think that, you know, I'll just fast and good things will happen, that's not always true. There's, there's spirit-led fasts. Jesus got baptized in the Holy Ghost after he came up out of the water in John's baptism. Now, most of us, I think probably I would have been in that group at least at one time in my life. When I came up out of the water and... John saw the Holy Ghost come down upon me like a dove and rest upon me and anoint me for service, I would have been making a beeline for Jerusalem. I got the anointing. I'm ready. I've been waiting for this all my life. Here we go. But the Holy Spirit had a little different idea. See, Jesus knew enough to not just take something and run off and try to use it for his own purpose or in his own wisdom, without the direction of the Father. The Holy Ghost led him into the wilderness. Now think about how contradictory that sounds to the human mind. Here I am, empowered for service, anointed by the Holy Ghost, been waiting, my Father says, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased, which is what a, a person who was preparing for priesthood that was said by the Father over them when they were entering into their priesthood ministry. It's time to grab a microphone and preach, hallelujah. But the Holy Ghost says, no, no, it's not. It's time to go fast. And not only fast, 40 days fast. Hallelujah. Now, I'm not talking about fasting today. I'm talking about how we need to understand that even in our good intentions, if we try to live out of our soul and the limited amount of understanding we have, we can miss it even trying to do something good. Now, that doesn't disqualify us. God doesn't stop loving us. He doesn't fall off of his throne because John Purcell's a human now and then. Matter of fact, John Purcell's a human 24-7. Amen? But Jesus was teaching his disciples here some things to keep them in that place where they could go forward and come into the fullness. Everybody say fullness. God's intention for you is to walk in the fullness of, of the purpose and of who you are and the giftings and what he put you on this earth to do and to be. Now, don't get scared. He, he can get you there. But listen, he can't get you there without your cooperation. That's why you've heard me preach recently about discipleship. You study what Jesus said about discipleship. He said, if you're not willing to pick up the cross every day and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. He didn't say, I'm mad at you, I'm ticked at you, you're out of here, I reject you. What he was saying is, you're going to try to do something and, and, uh, in a way that it's impossible to get it done. Now, picking up the cross, what does that mean? That doesn't mean you go get crucified, literally. That means that you, your will and God's will are going to cross paths. They're going to go two different directions, I should say. And so you're going to have to be willing every day to submit your will to his will. That doesn't mean you have to have this prophetic word from heaven every day to walk in, but it does mean that you have a heart to where if God does speak to you or reveal something to you, you'll hear it because you, no, I, I want to do the Father's will, not my will. Just like Jesus. He said, I didn't come to do my thing. I came to do his. I don't do anything unless I see my Father do it. He lived with a heart toward the Father because he knew that the only way things could get done in his life and through him as he was an, a, an anointed man standing in the prophet's office, a God-man nevertheless, but an anointed man, Philippians says that he left his heavenly position as the glorified Son of God in heaven, came down here, took on a body, and became anointed by the Spirit so that he could pass all of the tests that Adam and Eve failed and that he could undo, he could redeem the time all the way back to the Garden of Eden to set us free. But he knew the only way that's going to happen is if I cooperate and the Father has control by his spirit of my life, my mind, hallelujah, 
The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2, we have the mind of Christ. Are your mind's anointed. If you let the anointing go into your mind. If you don't start, well, hey, I think this and I think that, and then listen to the devil all day as he lies and accuses. and You cooperate with him, I got news for you, it ain't going to work. Are you here? Look at your neighbor and say, I'm sure glad you came today. You need to hear this. Hallelujah. <laughs> and then tell them, so do I. Praise God. Amen. So it's not about dead works. It's not about earning something. It's not about, you know, impressing God. How can you impress somebody who with the breath of his mouth creates universes? You know, these occultic people levitate a table. <laughs> Big deal. God's levitating the universe. It's true. The planets are hanging out there in space, man. By the word of his power. Glory to God. I'm not impressed by all that. I can tell you a good story about that, but I don't have time this morning. So here in Matthew 6, Jesus is, a, is addressing both spiritual and natural things, Matthew 5, Matthew 6, in this whole area, talking to him about being the, the light of the world. And he, he goes through this whole thing. He gets over into 6, and he starts talking about M-O-N-E-Y. Now, the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. I don't know that I fully understand that. I don't think anybody probably does, but God. But it, stuff seems to be a whole lot more of a problem to people than a lot of other things. Amen. Thank you. So he's dealing with that. Just let me show you one thing here real quick. It's not really what I'm preaching. You're not taking that off my preaching time, are you? Okay. Look here at verse 19 real quick. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. Uh-oh, he's getting ready to tell me to put all my money in the offering. No, I'm not. <laughs> Verse 20, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I want my heart in heaven. I want my spirit focused in heaven. I want the kingdom of God, there to be an inner flow between me and my Father in my heart. I don't want stuff in my heart that's going to block off the ability to comprehend. See, that's what Jesus was saying about disciples. Disciples, a person who's a disciple, it says over in John 8, it says that if you continue in his word, if you live in it, you abide in it, you do it, you, it, it becomes the way of life for you as you listen to him, as you walk with him, as you read his word and, 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 and let him talk to you and, and bring you into your fullness. If you continue in his word, then you are a disciple indeed. Not in word only. Anybody can call themselves a disciple, but that doesn't make them one. Jesus said to one group, he says, why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord? You don't do what I tell you. You're not submitted to my lordship. You can sit in your garage and go budden, budden, beep, beep. That doesn't make you a car. You can go to church every day of your life. That doesn't make you a Christian. It's a hard issue. Amen? So he says here, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. When I really gave my life over to, to, for the call of God on my life, one of the first things God came after me in was the area of money. Because I had great fear. I didn't have great fear of money. I had great fear of not having money. I've never met a dollar bill I was afraid of yet, you know. Come on, are you here? And so he, he understood. I have, because, see, whatever you fear, if, if, if your fear is greater than uh, God's voice in your life, then the, that fear is going to dominate you, and it'll cut you off from being able to comprehend what God's saying in your life. Jesus says it right here. Look at 22. For the light of the body is the eye. I used to think these two scriptures were put in the wrong place in the Bible or something. They didn't make sense to me. He's talking about money. Then he says, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is single. In other words, there's not a duplicity. When Peter was walking on the water, 
Jesus pulled him up out of the water, took him to the boat, and he said, why did you doubt? That word doubt means why did you try to look at two things at one time? Your eyes got to be single. It says if your eye is single, your whole body is full of light. But if your eye be evil, the word evil there, and every Jew in the world understands this that's studied the scriptures and, and all that, an evil eye means a greedy or stingy eye. See, because you actually think something you have, you own. You don't own any of it, honey. None of it belongs to you. Your next breath doesn't belong to you. The Bible says in Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. That covers it all. And they that dwell therein. Not everybody in the earth is God's child, but everybody was made by God. And so in that sense of the word, he owns them. Are you here? We're just administrators. We're those that steward, yes, that steward things. He says, if your eye is evil, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you be darkness, how great is the darkness? He's addressing money. He's addressing people's attitudes towards stuff. And he's saying that if you don't put money in its right place, that's why he came after me. I used to wonder why he was picking on me. Why, why are you so after me in this area? Because he had to get out of me that greedy attitude. He had to get out of me that fearful attitude. That attitude that the devil would use not only to torment me every day. I, I had my own business, a small business at one point, and I had several thousand dollars, at, this is back in the 70s, in the bank and everything. And if work just slowed down a little bit, I started having an acid stomach. I'm getting nervous. Fear! That's wrong, man. God doesn't want me to live tormented. He doesn't want you to live tormented. And so you know what his answer to it was? Give. Not just giving for giving's sake. John, you've got to find out that money's a tool, not a God. You've got to find out that, you know, it's like he told me one time. He's had to get on me uh, over this several times over the years. Now, I know probably not you. One day he told me this. He said, John, I have got more ways to get money to you than you could ever figure out, so will you quit worrying about it? I had a pastor friend of mine. He was sitting in his chair at home, and he was just grinding over worrying about money and the bills being paid at the church or whatever the problem was. And he said, it's the only time I've ever had God yell at me. He said, he yelled at me. I heard his voice. And he said, well, he called his name. I'm not going to tell you his name. None of your business. Amen. So-and-so, I've called you to minister to the people. I will meet your needs. Quit worrying about money. Hallelujah. Now, Jesus said right here in these two verses, 22, 23, he said, if your relationship and your heart is not right where money's concerned, he said, you are spiritually blind. I didn't say it. He did. And I'm here to tell you, I've been pastoring over 30 years now, and I've dealt with all kinds of people, all kinds of counseling situations, you know, and things. And I, I can tell you this, that the people who have a problem in this area are more spiritually blind than other people in the body of Christ. From experience, I can tell you. Before I even understood what these scriptures mean, I saw it. It was like they, they just couldn't understand certain things. I'm like, there it is. I didn't plan on preaching on this this morning, so don't get mad at me. Well, you can get mad at me if you want. It won't do you any good. But You know, God loves us. He loves us enough to tell us when we're wrong. He's trying to get us out of darkness into light. Amen. Hallelujah. Verse 24, no man can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love, and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot, you cannot serve God and the demon behind riches that wants to make money your God. Remember the, the last big shot the devil took at Jesus in the wilderness? 
You know, Jesus, if you will just fall down and worship me, see all these kingdoms of the world? It says he showed them to him in a moment of time. He gave him an open vision and showed him all the wealth of the world, the vast wealth of the world. I'll give it all to you because Adam turned it over to me when he sinned, and I'm the God of this world, and I'm dominating it all through the deception and the blindness in the hearts of men, and I manipulate them and have them do what I want them to do with it, basically is what he was saying. And I'll put you in charge of it, big liar. He wouldn't have, but he, he saved that one. to. He thought that this is going to get him right here. What he didn't know is that Jesus, well, maybe he did know it, just didn't want to admit it. I don't know. Jesus already was in the process of taking it back. Come on, are you here? I'm not, ask, I'm not up here to con you, beat up you on money, you know, beat you up over money, try to, you know, one for the Father, one for the Holy Ghost, one for the, I'm not up here to do some kind of religious game. I'm here to tell you, get, get between you and God, get things straightened out. Be man enough or woman enough to say, God, where am I wrong in my thinking? Talk to me. And whatever you say to me, even though I may not, you ever had an argument with God? How many of you won the argument? No, we don't win those arguments because he's always right. It may take me a long time to figure out why he's right, but he's right. Father, you're getting me in trouble this morning. You better get me out of this. Hallelujah. So Jesus is he's dealing with issues because he knows these issues. I've seen people, good people that, that had, you know, they were saved. They, they had anointing. They had giftings. They had abilities. But this right here, man, the devil just threw that noose of the, the love of money around their neck and worked some kind of situation out where they got offended over it and just jerked them down. Some of them aren't even in church anymore. They're not serving God anymore. Over money! All right, let's get over here where I maybe I'll get out of trouble. Verse 25, therefore, because of all this teaching he's done, you might want to go home and start at chapter 1 and read through this or whatever this week. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life. Now, doesn't that sound ridiculous to say something like that? I mean, on, on the surface, think about it. You mean I'm supposed to not even just worry or be concerned about anything in my life? He didn't say, don't use your brain. He didn't say, don't walk in common sense. He didn't say, if the laundry's dirty, don't wash it because you're waiting for a word from heaven. Or if you need a bath, don't take one because the Holy Ghost cloud hasn't shown up in your bathroom. I've met some people that need that word right there, amen? But see, we can get super over-spiritual just like we can be under-spiritual. So he says, take no thought for your life. What he's saying is, is that I have already predestined a pathway, a plan. I've already drawn the road map for you. And not only that, I'm God and I live outside of time, so I can jump into time anywhere I want to. I've already been in your future, seen what it's all about, and prepared everything you'll need in your future. And when you got born again, and then two years later backslid and ran from me for about a year, I knew that was going to happen too. And I still received you as my child. Come on. The things that surprise us don't surprise him. He's already been there. And he's been there to make preparation for us. You know, when Jonah ran from God, he was mad at that nation because they'd murdered his people. He wanted to see judgment fall on them. Read the book of Jonah. And he ran from God. He got out there and got in the storm, and uh, these people realized that something's wrong spiritually here. And he finally fessed up and said, it's me. I'm running from God. He said, throw me over the side, and the storm will stop. And they did. <laughs> They didn't have a prayer meeting for Jonah. They didn't cry out for mercy. Get that dude. Whoa, here we go. Amen. And you know the story. A fish was prepared and took him to Nineveh or to the shore, and he walked to Nineveh. 
That fish wasn't punishment. That fish was provision. He needed a way to Nineveh. He could have done it easy, but he decided to do it hard. Now, none of us have ever, we, we all just listen to the voice of God and flow with the Holy Ghost every day. That's our goal. Amen? Praise God. You know, one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible is in Jonah. It says, they that observe lying vanities will forsake their own mercy. There are some things you see, things you think, things that the enemy shows you or that you come up with on your own that are vain and they're lies. And you'll walk away from the mercy of God, at least for a period of time if you follow that. Moving right I'll ride along so that, since that went over so big. Take no thought for your life. Now, what is he saying? He's saying subject yourself to a place where you allow me to put my thoughts into your mind from my spirit and by my word so that I can direct your steps. The Bible says that if we will set our eyes on him. What's that, that verse over there? Is it in Proverbs? It says, uh, come on, Karen, you're supposed to be in the Holy Ghost and know what I'm thinking here. Yeah, that's it. See, I told you. Proverbs 3. Lean not to your own understanding. Now, how's, how's it go? Lean not to your own understanding in all of your ways. I looked that word ways up one time, and it means the ways you're walking, the pathway, the daily thing. In all of your ways, acknowledge. The word acknowledge means look at him. Look to him. In all of your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. First time I was going to be on Christian TV to do an interview, I was nervous as a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs. <laughs> Amen. Been waiting to use that one for a while. You know, I've never been on TV. What am I going to say? How do they do this? I, mean, I, don't want to, I hope I don't look like a big stupid fool on TV, you know. And I was laying, I, I woke up early and prayed fast and hard in the Holy Ghost. And I was laying on the couch asleep. I drifted back off to sleep, and I woke up. And as soon as I woke up, that verse just was put in my mind. So I said, okay, Lord, I'm not going to worry about it. I'm not going to take thought for my life in this. You're going to show me what to do, what to say. So I got to the, the station there, and the, the lady there that was going to interview us greeted us. Well, what are you going to share today on your segment? I said, I don't know. She kind of looked at me with a little bit of a pen because the first time we'd ever done this, you know, she didn't know me that well. She looked at me with a little bit, of, uh, well, you, you don't know what you're going to say? I said, no. She goes, well, are you going to talk about this or that? I said, I don't know. She says, well, well, I said, look, I just, and I told her what had happened, you know, I kind of shared it with her. She goes, oh, okay. And we got on there, and man, that time went by like that. And the words just flowed out of me. It wasn't, it wasn't going to be me. He had some things to say to some people that were watching that program. So he flowed through it. So that's what Jesus is saying. Don't get caught up in this thing of trying to take care of things in your life. You're so distracted, the enemy is able to use that to push you off of your purpose. Because the pathway that God, ha that God has for you is a very customized, purposeful pathway. You know my testimony. When I was 29, I finally answered the call that I, as a 16-year-old came to my life repented, gave God my life, made, you know, made this big, bold statement that I wondered later if I should have. God, no matter what you say, I'm yours. Or no matter what you lead me to do or you show me to do, I'm going to do it even if I don't understand it as long as I know it's you. Oh, yeah. Then the first thing he told me not long after that was to do something that made absolutely no sense whatsoever to me. He said, I want you to leave your church and go over to this other church that you don't like. Not that I didn't like the people, but the way they did church. I didn't feel comfortable there. Do you know God's got to get you out of your comfort zone sometimes to get you into some things he has for you? Your flesh likes comfortable. Amen? But I look back now, it was the perfect wisdom of God. He put me in this church, put Karen and I in this church. It took him three months to convince us to leave our church. It made no sense to us. Our families were there. We'd gotten married there. All of our friends were there. My whole life was there. And then God says, go over here with these wild people in this little church over here that I don't even know. 
But see, I wanted the will of God in my life. Amen. And so four years later, we're pioneering a church because he was able to do what he needed to do. And I look back now and I see how in the church I was in, it wasn't a bad church. Thank God for them. Thank God for all that they put into my life. Thank God I met my beautiful wife there. Thank God for all that's happened there and is happening there even now. But the pathway for me was a different path. Look at your neighbor and say, I received that in Jesus' name. So let's, let's get into this here. Take no thought for your life what you shall eat or what you shall drink. Uh, I'm not going to get into that. Nor yet for your body what you shall put on or is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment. So what's he talking about here? He's talking about the natural things of life. Making life work in the natural realm. Behold. Now when you see the word behold in the Bible, it doesn't mean just check it out. Just look at it. Just glance at it. Just hear it. Behold. See, what Jesus is telling them is you need to listen to what I'm saying here. You're going to see what I'm saying, and you need to meditate on this until you've got it. Until it, and it may challenge your thinking. It may, you may realize, oh my God, I've been doing that for 30 years. Or it may present a whole new, uh, you know, revelation to you. He wants you to behold that, meditate on it. The Jews were a whole lot more into meditation than we are in the church. They'd have their evening meal, they'd go out somewhere and get alone and meditate on the word. The word, meditation is so powerful. You know, in our time, it kind of got captured by the New Age and the occult, and Christians were afraid to meditate. Don't use the word meditate, even though it's in the Bible. Joshua chapter 1, God told Joshua, Joshua, you're getting ready to go into some circumstances you haven't been in for 40 years. You're going to face walled cities and giants. You're going to have to take this land forcefully by the sword, and here's how you're going to do it. Meditate in my word day and night so that you'll, be, you'll stay on the path of staying with my word, and then you will have good success and you'll prosper. Amen? Go back and meditate on what God has said to you. Amen? Stay with it. Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, gather the, into barns, or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, they, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. Yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothes the grass of the field which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you O ye of little faith. Now he's teaching his disciples. He's helping them make an adjustment. Everybody say an adjustment. They're having to adjust from having things in their life in the wrong place. And their thinking is wrong. Ask God to show you things through his eyes. Ask God to show you how he sees things. Ask him to show you his perspective. Because I don't care how, how far along you are as a disciple of the Lord, there's still a place that he wants to take you to in, in understanding and wisdom. Amen? Don't ever, don't ever become an expert. You're getting ready to be a Pharisee. Because a Pharisee is a know-it-all. Keep growing. When you can walk on water, we might talk about it. Amen? Praise God. So he says here, he's saying, look, I take care of the birds, take care of the grass, the flowers. They're even more glorious than Solomon. What a statement that is. Verse 31, therefore take no thought. Now thoughts are coming. The devil's going to see to it. He's going to hit your head with machine gun bullets of thoughts. Accusation, shame, fear, all the stuff. We all get it every day. The devil is faithful to his ministry. Brother Kenneth Hagin used to say one thing about him. He is, he is a persistent cuss, he used to call him. Amen. But Jesus said, you've got to discern which one of these thoughts you're going to take and you're going to reject. That's what it, Paul wrote when he says, cast down vain imaginations. 
vain images, vain reasonings really is what it means, that lifts itself up against the knowledge of God. The Word of God, when you study the Word, see, some Christians don't study their Bible. They got that little thing we have in the back back there, the little, uh, what is it, word for the day or whatever it is, daily word. And that's, that's their study. Are you kidding me? That's like eating one cookie or one potato chip. Come on, go ahead and admit it. You can't eat just one. If you can, come and lay hands on me. I need your anointing. Impart, brother. Used to have a little promise box. The scripture for the day. And that's good. There's nothing wrong with that. But you, we need to study. The Bible says study to show yourself approved. A workman who won't end up in shame. Because you don't know what you're doing and you're trying to do it without God and his wisdom and his leading. You're going out here thinking that you're going to get the benefits of being a disciple and you're still a baby Christian because you refuse to eat meat and you're over there sucking on your bottle getting mad when people won't change your die dye for you. I don't have a lot of time, folks. I've got to be playing. It's true. People who live in constant drama and offense are babies spiritually. I don't care how long they sit in church. I don't care. They could know the Bible better than I know it from a perspective of remembering. Memorizing Scripture doesn't do much for you. It's when you get the Scriptures written in your heart and it becomes part of your life. And, you know, Jesus was the Word made flesh. We're the flesh being made the Word. Amen? Hallelujah. Lord, you better get me out of this. Glory to God. Where was I at? 32? Okay, I'm, we're at 32. The general consensus is. For after all these things do the Gentiles, the non-covenant people, seek. That's their priority. For your heavenly Father knows what you have need, that you have need of all these things. Now notice this. Now here's the thing. I heard a man of God say this recently, and it just, man, it hit me between the eyes. He was ministering to another minister. This other minister had these kind of family curse cycles that just kept cycling in his life and cycling in his family, even though he was a Christian. And this other pastor had had a revelation about going before the, the throne of God, before the courts of heaven, and getting a verdict from God. See, when you go into the throne... Over in Hebrews 12, it says that God's the judge. God's a lot of different things. He's your father. He's your king. You know, he's your healer. He's a, but he's also a judge. And you can go before him and get a verdict rendered on your behalf based on what is already legal. See, it's not going to happen for you any more in your life spiritually than it is in the natural realm. If somebody's ripping you off, stealing your money, you don't just take a gun and go get your money back. At least I hope you don't. You go to the judge and get a verdict rendered so that there can be an enforcement of the law. Well, we need to go before God sometimes and, uh, and plead our case. Now, here's the deal. The devil knows you, and he knows if you're playing some kind of spiritual game. And he can step, like if you're living in unforgiveness and you're going before God, Lord, I, I, I want to be healed. The devil has a legal right to step in and say, uh-uh, they know to forgive and they're not doing it. I, I heard one pastor recently he was in his church service. He walked by a lady going into the service and she said, I'm in so much pain and I haven't been able to get healed. And so he prayed for her and nothing was happening. Nothing changed. He said, I, I didn't have a word from God or anything. He said, I just looked at her and said, well, are you in unforgiveness with anybody? She said, oh, yeah, yeah, this, blah, blah, this and, that and that. So he talked to her. And she prayed and asked God to forgive her. She forgave the people. And he said, within a few minutes, she was totally healed. Don't think the devil doesn't have a legal right to block things in your life. Yes, he does. Well, I might have thrown your theology for a leap there, and I don't know. I'm, I'm just telling you I know that when people won't deal with things, it hinders other things. Let's put it that way. 
So he says, the heavenly father knows what you have need of. This minister was getting ready to pray for this other pastor, and they were going to go before the Lord and ask him to render a verdict for this man's family, and, you know, if they were going to pray for forgiveness for their ancestors. They were going to pray for forgiveness for themselves. They were going to just clear the deck, make sure nothing was there. And he said, when I got ready to minister to this other pastor, he said, I literally heard the Lord yell in my ear, don't you dare bring him to me based on his need. You bring him to me based on his purpose. See, if God was into just meeting needs because they were there, the world would be free of need. I mean, he's, he's God. He's all-powerful. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. He's full of grace and mercy and love. If all it took was that there's a need there, then he'd automatically meet it. It'd be done. Come on, are you here? But see, here's the thing we've got to stand up and step up and be honest about. I was put on this earth for a reason. I have a purpose in his kingdom. And if I, which I was doing, you know, I got called in the ministry at 16, 29 years old. If I had said that day when he confronted me and talked to me about this, I would have said, well, I, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go do this over here. I'm refusing my purpose, I'm refusing his path, and therefore I'm refusing what he can do for me in my life. See, the thing you've got to understand about your purpose is everything you'll ever need, and I think that's what Jesus was trying to get over here, everything you'll ever need naturally, spiritually, you name it, it's all in the pathway that's called your purpose. Who are you in the kingdom? What are you supposed to be doing in the kingdom? Well, I'm, I, I prayed the sinner's prayer, and, you know, I, I kind of like so-and-so church, so that's where I go. And, uh, you know, I, I try to be good. I don't kick the dog. I don't yell at my wife and, you know, pay my taxes. And I'm just about to pay my tithes someday. Now, that may sound foolish, but that's the way people think right there. They're still on the throne in their life. They're not asking God, what should I do? Who am I? What am I supposed to be? See, the devil works all your life to make you the opposite of who you are. Look at Abram and Sarah. Abram's name, high father. He was a high father. He was a big shot in the community. He, you know, he had uh, wealth. He had position. He had a influence. He had all these things. But him and Sarah, God says, wait a minute. That's not who you are. That's part of who you are. But that's not who you really are. That's not why you're here on earth. You are Abraham. You're a father of a multitude. I don't care if you are almost 100 years old. I don't care if your wife is almost 100 years old. Your purpose on here was to start this race that would end in the seed of Abraham, Jesus Christ. That's why God always challenges people when they, you know, he comes to Abraham and says, get out of here and go where I tell you. See, if you won't get out of here and go where he tells you, you won't ever come to a place where you'll, you'll cooperate where God can fulfill your purpose. It's true. Oh, no, he's putting something else on me. No, I'm not. I'm setting you free from a bunch of garbage. That's what Jesus was telling these guys. He knew they were going to come under this pressure. Amen? Amen? Verse 33, but seek first. This word first means in time, in place, in order, in importance. Seek first in time, in place, in order, and importance. You know, I try to meet with the Lord in the morning. I'm a morning person. And I try to meet with the Lord in the morning every day, not because I'm trying to impress God or whatever. I need to hear from him. I've got to stay in my purpose. You heard me tell the story how, you know, a few years back, I'm going down to Fresno and ministering and doing something that there again, in the natural, it didn't look right to me. Lord, am I just wasting my time? What am I doing here? And he, he took the opportunity when I finally asked him a question about it. We're so good at just keep on going, just keep on going. It's not working, but let's keep on going. He said, you don't even understand your own ministry. 
Oh, great, I've been pastoring 30 years and don't understand my own ministry. That was my first thought. And he said, no, I didn't say that. What I'm saying is where you're at now and what I have for you to do, you don't understand that because ministry is progressive. Everything in your life is progressive. Everything in your life is moving into something. There is The word retirement is not in the Bible. Now, I'm not saying you can't curtail your activities after your body gets to a certain age and you can't adjust things you need to and all that kind of thing. But really, the last third of your life should be the best years of your life. It should be the harvest of everything you've planted in your life. But the devil's preached some doctrine to the, the people of God. Well, you're old, over the hill. You're done, out to pasture. Just go sit down somewhere and die. Baloney. My dad's 87 years old. Eight, no, 89, yeah. Man, I had him a couple of years younger. Well, it's because he acts 87. 89 years old. He broke his leg, so, and we didn't shoot him. Hallelujah. Sometimes I just say stupid things. You'll have to forgive me. If you understood my culture and where I came from, you'd get that. But anyway... You know, he broke his leg ministering. Now, if he'd have listened to his son and used a walker instead of a cane, he wouldn't have broke his leg. But he didn't receive that prophecy. But he doesn't let grass grow under his feet. He gets in his old red pickup truck, and puts his cowboy hat on, his belt buckle, and his boots. Been trying to get him to get rid of those boots, too. They're not as stable. And he goes, in, to these, he goes to the rest homes. He goes to different places around town. Wherever they will let him sing, he shows up. Don't tell him you want to hear him sing. You'll be at your front door. Unless you mean it. He says, well, I'm going over to the rest home to sing to those old people. That's what he tells me. Half of them in there are younger than him. But you see, retirement, I mean, even though he's retired from being a builder and all that stuff, He's not retired. He's refired. And every now and then he'll say, do you think I'm doing any good? Dad, do I think you're doing any good? You're going into places where people are, one of, they got one leg in hell and the other one's sliding in. And you're going in there singing the gospel to them and you've led people to Christ. What do you mean are you doing any good? Amen? Purpose. You still got a purpose. I don't care how young you are, old you are, where you live, what side of the tracks you were born on, what color you are, or any of that stuff that, that his disciples would have got hung up on. Are you here? He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Where's the kingdom of God at? It's right here. You don't have to go to heaven to be in heaven. It's in you. I know there's a place, heaven, but the kingdom's in you. Seek first the kingdom, it says, of God and, what's, and his righteousness. What is right in your life for him? See, for me to say, you know what? I've preached a long time. I think I'll just go over and start selling insurance. I can be a blessing to people. People that don't have insurance when they have a need, they'll have it now. And they'll be able to you know, get out of a mess if they have their house burned down or something. I could start thinking that way. But if it's not my purpose to do that, I'm in sin and disobedience. I would be because I know better. I've been hit on the head enough times that I know to ask questions before I try to do something like that. Come on. Now, now think about this for a minute. I'm going to close here in a second. How many of you will give me one more second? My seconds are long. Think about this. That pathway that God has for you, it's, it's your purpose pathway. God, who am I? What am I supposed to be doing here? And as you follow him, you listen to him daily. You know, I have people come to me, well, I don't know what I am in the body of Christ. Don't worry about it. You'll figure it out. Just follow him every day. Listen to him. Let him take you down the path day, and one day you'll wake, uh, pathway, and one day you'll wake up and go, you know what? just seems like the Lord's using me more like in this than he is anything else. 
He has, you have giftings already put in you. There's a calling on you. There's a direction. The angels are standing around twiddling your th their thumbs waiting for you to wake up so they can help you get there. Amen. He says what's right in his eyes are righteousness and all these other things. They're in the pathway of your purpose. You don't have to worry about money because money's out there waiting for you. Listen, when it's God's will, it's his bill. We go out and do our will and try to get him to pay the bill. He's not going to do it. At least for a while he won't because he wants you to figure out you can't do that. You're trying to get me to do things the way I don't do things. And, and not only that, what I have for you is so much better than you could ever do on your own anyway. Amen. So you just find your purpose, and you head down that road. Will you run into the devil? I can tell you, you will. Probably about five steps down the road. Because the devil is not intimidated by what you think you know or what you can do in the natural realm or this or that. or your, He don't even really give a rip about your opinion. Because he knows if it's not God's opinion, it's not worth the powder to blow it up. If it's a mixture of man's ways and God's ways, it's like putting water and oil together. You don't take a drink. But when you say, Lord, not my will be done, I mean, Jesus said this from the time, he, he did this from the time we talked about him coming up out of the water and following the Holy Ghost into the wilderness when it looked like he should have went down there and started casting out devils and raising the dead. And at, here he is at the end of his life in the Garden of Gethsemane under so much pressure in his soul. He, now, Jesus never exaggerated, and he never lied. And he said, my soul is so sorrowful, I'm about to die. This is about to kill me, the mental pressure that's on me. And he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. The physicians will tell you that the, the capillary is close to the surface of your skin. You can be under so much emotional pressure, an extreme amount of emotional pressure, to where those things actually erupt, and out through your pores comes a mixture of sweat and blood. That's where he was at. But yet, what did he pray? Not God. He prayed what I would have prayed. God, if there's any other way to do this, I've seen what the Romans do to people. And not only that, I don't know what it means to be separated from you. I think he was more concerned about that than he was about the physical part myself. He said, if there's any other way to do this, please, let's do it. But if not, not my will, but your will. Here he is under the most extreme pressure a human being could be under emotionally. And he's still saying, I'm going to follow my purpose. And we get upset when Sister Bucketmouth gossips about us. Or I'm 50 bucks behind on my pg and &E bill. Oh, God, where are you? Are you even real? Come on. I've heard people say that. We've got to find our purpose and follow it. Now, I'm not saying you're not. You may be. I'm not up here to judge you or, you know, put a big heavy trip on you. But I am here to tell you that this is real. Amen. I've watched it happen in people's lives. I've watched people try to be Lord half of the way and God half of the way Lord. God won't put up with that forever. Now, he understands when we're young. We don't know. You know, I'm, I'm in my 20s. I'm was raised in church, but I didn't have a clue about a lot of things. And he had to, you know, he was merciful to me and helped me. But the one thing he called me on, he said, you're not following me and you know you're not. And, I, and he said this to me that day in my work truck. I can't cover you anymore. You're at a point where you need to make a decision because you're at a fork in the road for your future on this earth. And he even gave me a little glimpse of some things if I made the right decision. He does that. In the Bible, through Moses, he said, I set before you this day blessing and cursing. Let me give you a clue. Choose the blessing part. That's kind of what he did with me that day. And I made a decision to follow him. And I've made mistakes. I've messed up. I've gotten the flesh. I've let fear dominate me at times. And I had, he had to deal with that in my life here a while back, too, in some areas. But 
the thing about it is, is if you stay with your purpose, he will take you apart, just like he did Abraham. He'll put you back together again, and he'll cause you to fulfill. See, I want to come to the end of my life, and I want to say what Jesus said. I want to be able to say it. I have glorified you on the earth. You can't do that outside of your purpose. He's either Lord of all or not Lord at all. I'm not saying you're not in his family. I'm not saying you're not, you're not one of his kids. My opinion, maybe I shouldn't even say this publicly, but I'm going to anyway. My opinion is that the vast majority of the church lives and dies as baby Christians. And I'm not putting myself up on some pedestal, holier than thou, I know it all, and you don't. What I'm saying is, if you learn the characteristics of this, and you see it in people's lives, and most of the time it's because they won't do, they, they're, they love Jesus and they're, they're all for it until they come up to the pain position where it's going to hurt and cost them, and they're going to have to give up their will completely in order to do his will. That's where a lot of people stop right there. And if it gets uncomfortable enough in the church they're in, they go find a church that they can sit in where they're not challenged. See, if I don't challenge you, I'm not doing my job. I'm not here to condemn you, put you down. I love you. God loves us. He'll embrace us. He'll help us. He'll comfort us. He'll, he'll strengthen us. He'll, if we fall down and we get up, he'll help us move on. But there comes a place in time where we have to say, what am I in your kingdom for? Who am I? What do you want to use me for? And I'm going to follow after you, and I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to pursue you and talk to you every day, and I'm asking you to talk to me because I might be at a place right now where you're wanting me to change gears and shift and go a different direction, and I don't even know it. What if I hadn't asked God that, that question on Highway 99 that night? Am I just wasting my time? I wonder how long it would have took for me to realize I didn't know what I was doing. I already knew I didn't know what I was doing because it, it wasn't working. But <laughs> it's amazing how we can just go on. Has this helped you today? You know, my, my nature as a human, my personality I'm real I'm a real nice easy going type guy with people I am really I like to smooth things out I don't like to stir the waters but when I get under the anointing sometimes things come out of me that even I have trouble with in my flesh but it's true it's true so let's just pray right now Hallelujah. <clears throat> you see, the days we're living in are very um, intense days. Naturally, spiritually, every other way. We're moving forward into a time where there's going to be, uh, there's already a major shifting happening in the earth, and it's going to be even more so. And we need to be in a place where anything the devil does or says or tries to scare us with or manifest in any way it does not detour us from our purpose. Jesus was not impressed with the devil. And you can't afford to be either. A lot of Christians are more afraid of the devil than they are God. They don't have the fear of the Lord in them. I'm talking about a bad fear, a negative fear. But many of them are very intimidated by the things of the devil. The devil, my friend, is a defeated foe. Now, you don't go out and get in a boxing match with him without the Holy Ghost leading you but at the same time we have nothing to fear and nothing to worry about my greatest concern is that I'm not being who he's called me to be doing what he's called me to do at the right place at the right time with the right people doing the right thing and so father today I pray right now pray for everybody here Lord whose heart is sincere toward you Lord, I just I know that we're in a time of shifting and adjusting and changing. Lord, you want to bless us. You want us to enjoy our lives. You want us to have good things in our life. We know that. It's obvious in the Word of God. But I also know, Father, that you have a plan and a purpose for each life. And so I pray for everyone here, myself included, once again, 
that you would make clear to us that purpose. Lord, if we're at a place right now where maybe we've come to a certain crossroad where you want to shift us in our life in a different direction, whether it's a natural thing or a, a spiritual thing, whatever it might be, I pray that your spirit would reveal that. I pray that as your people meet with you every day and they just look to you and they say, Lord, tell me what I need to know today. Speak to me, lead me, guide me. That you will minister to them your word, your spirit, and that they'll be able to fully function in what you have for them in this earth. We know that the devil, the enemy of our soul, tries to make us the opposite of what you've called us to be by his lies and his fear and all that he does. But Lord, we're so thankful that we can follow you. We can follow you when we're following your purpose. We can say Psalm 23 belongs to us. The Lord is our shepherd. We're following him. Therefore, we have no wants. We will have no wants because we'll always be where he is. We'll always be where he's been in our future, and we'll always have what he has waiting for us there. And so, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name, whatever needs to take place, if there's some adjustments that need to take place in our lives and hearts and minds, whatever needs to take place, maybe you just want to comfort someone or encourage someone who is on that path, and the enemy's been resisting them and attacking them. And all it is is just a testimony to them that they're in the right place, and that's why the devil's having such a fit. He's not getting his way again. But we thank you for the spirit of discernment. We thank you for the wisdom of God. Help us to separate the precious from the vile. Help us to see with the eyes of our understanding what you're showing us and what your spirit is saying to us. Help us to step up into that greater glory, that greater place that you have for us in our walk with you. Help us to be a manifestation of the purpose that you put us on this earth to be. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now, if you mean that prayer, if you agreed with me in that prayer and you mean that, and you start meeting with the Lord, you start just giving him some time in your life and just saying, here I am, Lord, I worship you. What do you want to say to me today? What do you want me to read today? What do you want to do in my life? It may not be some big lightning bolt from heaven, uh, you know, but he might just teach you something that in your mind doesn't even really connect with the circumstances you're in. But I can tell you this, he doesn't waste words and he doesn't waste time. And many times he's giving you something so that when you get to a certain circumstance, you'll already know what to do. You'll already have the answer. But we need to, to meet with him. Fifteen minutes drinking your coffee driving down the road is fine to praise him, but that's not meeting with him. Give him some time. Give him some time. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, is there anyone in here today you've never opened your heart and asked Jesus to come and be your Lord and Savior? You've never asked him to come into your life. You've never prayed what we call the sinner's prayer. See, the Bible says that we're born separated from the life of God, separated from his family, and that Jesus came to reverse that for us. But he's given us a free will, and we can choose whether we want to be a part <clears throat> of God's family or not. And so the Holy Spirit convicts our heart. And he shows us <clears throat> that we're separated from God for eternally, uh, eternity. And the Bible teaches us that. And he shows us that Jesus loves us so much. He came and died for us. And he's waiting for us to receive that eternal life, that life of God that he has for us, that he can give to us freely now. But here's the catch. You have to be willing to give him your life to have his life. It's an exchange. It's not something else you take and put in your pocket and carry around. It's a, a willingness to understand that I'm a sinner. Because I'm a sinner, I'm separated from the life of God for eternity. Instead of heaven being my destiny, hell will be my destiny. Yes, there is still a hell. A lot of people don't talk about it, but it is real. Jesus said it was. And so if you're here today and you've never received Jesus, he's saying to you, I don't want you to go to hell. I'm not going to send you to hell, but you decide today where you're going to go, heaven or hell. 
If you'll give me your life, truly, just come to me and say, Jesus, I want you to take control of my life. I want you to come into my heart. I want you to be my Lord and my Savior. If you're willing to pray that kind of prayer, make that kind of confession from a sincere heart, then he will do that. You give him your life, and he'll give you his life. So let's just all pray right now. If there's someone here and and that's the situation in your life, or you even may think that might be the situation, just pray right now with us. Just say, Heavenly Father, I come before you in Jesus' name. I acknowledge that I'm a sinner and that I need a Savior. I ask you to forgive me, Lord. I ask you to come into my heart. I give you my life. I give you all that I am and all that I have. I lay it at your feet. Thank you for eternal life. I receive your eternal life. I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth that you are my Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Let's all stand. Glory to God. I pray that you'll just consider what I shared today. Go home and spend some time with the Lord. I, you know, I'll just say this. I really feel Karen was talking a little bit about it. This time of year, there's a, God wants to really get some things over to us. Because the year we're coming into, the Lord had told me a couple of years back that 2017 was going to be a time of shifting and adjusting, but 2018, things were going to start happening. Evangelization was going to start happening. Manifestation was going to start happening. Well, I want to be in the right place at the right time with the right people doing the right thing for that to happen in my life. So just open your heart to him, let him talk to you, and he'll see to it that you're there. Father, thank you. We thank you for the service tonight as Pastor Mike ministers. We thank you, Lord, for all that you've uh, given us this morning. We thank you that you are good. I thank you, Father, that you bless your people this afternoon as they rest and they prepare for their week ahead. Lord, let tonight's service just be a glorious time with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.